and welcome to The Spectrum Show, the show dedicated to the Sinclair ZX Spectrum. Coming up in this episode, we get all the latest Sinclair news and top-selling Spectrum games from September 1986. I report on the recent Replay Expo. I review some older games. Take a look at a newer title. Jeff is back with another hidden gem. Jason continues his game development. And we take a look at some serious software. But first, it's the news. Saga, the peripheral and keyboard supplier for the Spectrum, is to move into the home micro market by producing an advanced Spectrum clone. They claim the new micro, named the Complement, will take the normal Spectrum and turn it into a serious workstation. Included will be a professional keyboard, a 3.5 inch floppy drive holding 256K, a high quality printer and the last word word processor, and also possibly a modem. Saga are aiming to provide the unit fully assembled and ready to use, but the legal problems have yet to be sorted out. As was seen previously with the QL problems, Amstrad are very strict when it comes to third party companies using their components. A new budget label was announced this month, boldly claiming that by the end of the year they will have captured 10% of the games market. Heading up the new company is the XMD of AI Products, the company responsible for the majority of Mastertronic games, and doing the coding will be his two sons. Who are this exciting new company? Well, Codemasters of course, run by Jim, David and Richard Darling. They plan to sell all of their games at 199, aiming to take on Mastertronic in their own arena. An argument about software license rights centred around the arcade game Gauntlet have finally been resolved, allowing both companies to release their games. The issue was around the similarities to the arcade game in two titles, Gauntlet and a game originally called Dauntless. Dauntless was to be released by Electric Dreams until US Gold stepped in, claiming their game was a copy of their license. However, as it turns out, Dauntless is a version of an older Atari 8-bit game called Dandy that in turn Gauntlet was based on. To avoid any further problems, Electric Dreams are now releasing their game with the changed title of Dandy. Konami, the arcade game producers, are to move away from their ties with Imagine Software and begin releasing under their own label. Games already in the pipeline for the Spectrum include Jailbreak, Nemesis and Iron Horse, with Salamander following on later. The new Spectrum Plus 2 will not arrive in shops as planned this month. Instead, users will have to wait a few more weeks until mid-October. It isn't clear what the delay is, but Amstrad are gearing up to spend over £2 million in advertising in the run-up to Christmas, and expect to take 40% of the games market within a few months of release. More news about the eagerly awaited mega game Star Trek from Beyond Software. They've been busy boasting about how impressive it will be, including digitised images of the crew, a thousand stars and 255 subplots all to play around with. They have, however, only released a few screenshots of early production versions, so there's not much to go on. And that was the news, and now on to the charts. From this episode on we'll be taking the charts from monthly magazines, which means we're working one month in advance, because then, as now, the next month's magazine is launched this month, if that makes any sense. And so, riding high in the charts this month are Commando, the arcade clone from Elite Bombjack, another arcade clone from Elite Quasitron from Houston Elite from Firebird And Matchday from Ocean and that was the news and top selling Spectrum games from September 1986. October saw the return of Replay Expo to my neck of the woods and who am I to resist? Although I went last year, I didn't put up a video, so this year it was time to put things right. As usual, the massive hall was filled with all kinds of things connected with video games, including elements I was not really interested in. 
as soon as I got in, I headed straight to the arcade section, and this is where I spent most of my time. It was great to play the real thing, and I enjoyed lots of different games from Pole Position and Galaxians to Tempest and Salamander. Initially, it was easy to get onto machines, but as more people arrived, the popular games sometimes had two or three people waiting to play. At this point I headed off, past the pinball section, which although I love, I left alone due to the queues, and went to view the rows and rows of consoles. There were a lot of them, and it was easy to get a game throughout the day on these. Famicoms, Amigas, Mega Drives, GameCubes, all up and running and ready to dive straight in. Mixed in were some TV games as we used to call them, things like ColecoVision, Intellivision, and the rather obscure Video Packer G7000. It was great to see so many younger people enjoying these too, often with their parents, trying in vain to explain how good these machines were. There were some familiar games on offer too, sometimes running on unexpected hardware. Commodores, Ataris, Vectrex, Master Systems, NES, SNES, and a whole lot more were there, as well as the Spectrums. I located about three of them, which was a bit of a letdown, although I did find a great little stand run by the Retro Computer Museum, which had some of the American models, and these were great to examine and see how different they felt from the familiar UK versions. I had a few plays on different machines, and about two hours in I sat down in front of a 48k Specky with a Div ID and loaded up Jetpack. Just for a quick blast I told myself. I had no idea how long I was sat there. I was vaguely aware of people walking past from time to time, mentioning the Spectrum and Jetpack, but I was dialed into the game, and it was here at Replay Expo on Sunday the 11th of October 2015 that I finally completed the game built every spaceship and ended up back at level 1 again. I've often tried to do this but never got past level 3. It was a great feeling. Someone behind me congratulated me. I had no idea who though. My score wasn't the highest in the world, but that didn't matter. With that done, I went to look at the stalls, selling things like t-shirts, badges, jewellery, fake weapons and a multitude of different other tat. And at times it reminded me of a car boot sale. I didn't stay there very long. There were the newer consoles too, like the PS4 and the Xbox One, along with network PCs and various competitions. But it was the arcade section that drew me back time and time again. An enjoyable day then! topped off by my accomplishment on Jetpack. Adventureland is one of the oldest and best known adventure games across all platforms, second only probably to Zork. Released in 1978, it finally made it to the Spectrum in 1985 and the game's author, Scott Adams, is also well known as he created a mass of adventure games through the 80s, 90s and beyond. Adventureland was the first in a series of many across multiple platforms and featured graphics on systems that supported it. The Spectrum version does include some nice graphics and the game begins in a forest. At first I wandered about trying various commands like examine sign and examine tree with very few of them actually working. I like how the graphics depict what's happening in the game, including things that you do in certain locations, like chopping trees down. But what I didn't understand was how to see exits or objects that might be there. And it was quite by accident that I pressed the enter key without entering any text. And I got the text description, along with exits and objects, and that made the game much more playable. I soon found an axe with a magic word on it that, when spoken, makes anything you're carrying disappear and reappear at a location called, of all things, Paul's Place. This is useful early in the game, because once you're in the quicksand bog, there's a little statue that cannot be taken away, unless, of course, 
you use the magic word. There's also a tree to be found in a swamp, and if you climb it, you'll find some writing on a web telling you to cut it down. Cutting it down opens up more places to explore. Watch out though, there's some nasty creatures called chiggers that bite you, and if not dealt with, will eventually kill you. To heal the bites, you just need the mud from the swamp. But be warned, don't go anywhere near the dragon if you're carrying the mud, because you'll die. And you better get used to that, because this happens quite a lot in this game. There are many places and objects where, by just going in the wrong direction, for example, you die, like the bottomless pit. Luckily though, that's not game over. You are sent to a location called Limbo, and to get out of there, you just move up. Anyway, back to the tree, and once you've chopped it down, you can go into the stump. And this is where you find the place to drop all of your treasure. So then, the game is a treasure hunt, just like the very first and original adventure game. From here, you can start exploring other underground places, each with a nice graphic, and many of them with deadly exits and things to kill you. Oh well, back to Limbo then. I enjoyed playing this game, once I'd found out how to get the text descriptions up, but the Limbo thing is still very annoying. Of course, if you get stuck in this day and age, you can always look on the internet for solutions. But if you're a serious adventurer, you'll give it a good try before going anywhere near those. Anyway, if you like adventure games, give this one and the rest of Scott Adams' games a try. It'll be some time before you finish them. This is Dandy, by Electric Dreams, released in 1986. The story of this game was briefly covered in the news section. Being renamed to avoid copyright issues, this dungeon crawler is obviously a version of the arcade favourite Gauntlet, and in fact was going to be called Dauntless. Electric Dreams got away with the name change, as they said it was based on an older game called Dandy. Anyway, on to the game then. You can play one of two characters, Thor or Sheba, and the aim is to work your way through 16 dungeons, killing monsters and collecting treasure and on the way finding clues that will help you solve a puzzle at the end. The gameplay is very similar to its arcade cousin. You have to collect keys that open doors, shoot things and avoid things, and try to negotiate the maze to find the exit. Some of the enemies don't chase you though, unlike the arcade game, so there's a fair amount of path clearing to do. Some enemies require multiple shots too, which is a real pain. Because the screen doesn't scroll, it makes navigation difficult, and all too often you flip into a screen packed with spiders, or whatever the nasties are, and end up losing a lot of health. Also, having previously cleared a screen, if you go back, the enemy are still there, they've respawned. Meaning you have to hack your way past them again, that's a bit naff. You can collect food to increase your health and magic, and the magic does one of several things, although I struggle to find out how to work it properly. Sometimes when I press the magic key nothing happens, sometimes the enemies froze, and sometimes they all vanished. But there's only one key, so I have no idea what was going on. The graphics are very colourful and well defined as you can see, and change as you progress through different levels. You must be very careful though to keep an eye on the number of keys you've got, because several times I reached the exit, needing just one key to carry on, but had used them all up earlier on. Sound is adequate without being outstanding, with effects for firing, collecting and killing. Gameplay is not too difficult, meaning you can progress quite far, and it's quite a good game once you get used to the differences from the arcade. If you go in with an open mind, not expecting to play Gauntlet, I think you'll really like this. Give it a try.
Stormfinch was written by R-Tape and released in 2015. Using the Nirvana engine to give glorious multicolored graphics, this classic horizontal shoot 'em up is firmly in the classic arcade mold. Using similar firing mechanics to R-Type, you have three weapons at your disposal. The usual yet ineffective laser, the blaster, which is enabled by holding down the fire key until the power builds up, and your Outrider. As each level of aliens arrive, the direction of attack is indicated at the bottom of the screen, and then it's up to you to manoeuvre into the best position and set your Outrider to the front or back to take care of them. The aliens are colourful too, and have a wide variety of looks, some evil and some not so serious. And their attack patterns vary, making the game very challenging. Control is crisp, and it needs to be for this type of game. The sound is great too, with a nice tune during play and some good effects. This then is a highly enjoyable game. Certainly give this one a try, I just wish I was better at it. Hello and welcome to Hidden Gems. In this section we take a look at some games that aren't as well known but are still superb and well worth picking up and playing even today. And today we're going to take a look at Mad Martha. Now I was never a huge adventure fan. I played The Hobbit quite a bit and really really enjoyed that and a few other adventures but I'm not a big adventure fan. This game was given to me by someone. Someone gave me the tape. It was actually quite a few years after it came out and they said have a go at this. It's a bit of fun and that's exactly what I found. It's just a great bit of fun. Mad Martha was released by Microgen in 1983. That's microgen of the Wally Week games. Unlike quite a lot of games, you don't play the titular character. You play her husband, so you are Mad Martha's husband who just wants to get out and have some fun. And this game is about trying to have some fun without your wife turning up and murdering you with an axe. Now, this game received a lot of criticism, and rightly so, I think. The pause isn't very good, and in particular, it is very, very slow. But one of the good things about revisiting these old games in modern times is you can emulate the game, turn up the speed of the emulator, later and voila all of a sudden the parser isn't as slow anymore there are some games on this list that i'm gonna say you need to be careful of you might end up playing them for hours and hours and hours they're going to be huge time sinks and i'll be honest with you this isn't one of them this isn't going to take you hours and hours and hours but it is a fun little game as i said at the start so the funny thing is that a lot of the obstacles are just normal everyday things except for your wife of course it isn't every day that somebody's wife murders them with an axe. But there are things like a crying baby, a cat that you've got to make sure that you avoid and don't trip over, only having one match to light something with. It's your last match and you need to light something. Now, who hasn't been in a situation like that before? And just generally, it's dark and you're not able to see and you're tripping over things in the night when you're trying to keep quiet and not disturb someone. Now, the graphics aren't great in this game. They're never going to win any prizes. And as I say, the parse is pretty rubbish. It's a typical verb-noun type adventure game. And like I said, it's very, very slow. Don't play this on original hardware, please. Fire up an emulator, load it into the emulator and crank up the speed to two or four times normal speed. However, when you start playing and get into it, there's just something really fun about it. I remember loading this up. Someone gave me the game, as I said, and I loaded it up into my Spectrum. Started playing, and I think the first thing that happened is the baby woke up. Then a few moves later, Martha turns up and kills you with an axe, and you think, wow, okay, let's start again. Obviously, I need something to pacify the baby before I can go into that room. So you try a different room, and there's a dummy. So you pick up the dummy, you take it into the baby's room you give the dummy to the baby and then I remember getting all the way to the outside and then realizing I didn't have any trousers on so you're back to the start again and it's a bit of a trial and error in that respect it's one of those very simple adventure games where you just got to get things right in the right order do the right thing and get through it 
but it's still a lot of fun. Now, as I say, this isn't going to be the greatest game ever. You're not going to be playing this forever and ever and ever. But I would encourage people, as I do every time, to pick up this game, have a little go of it, and, and just give it a play. If you like it, you like it. If adventure games aren't your thing, then it might not be for you. But give it a try. Adventure games aren't my thing, but I, I really enjoyed it. So until next time, happy gaming. It's time to see how the development of the Berserk game is going, with Jason Billow making progress on his version of the arcade classic. It's time to add some Berserkers to the game. Having had their graphics in the game right from the start, but not being in a position to actually use them, we can now at least get to see how they look. Currently, with a bit of additional code, they walk about and can be killed if they walk into walls, just like the arcade game. Our hero can also shoot them now, but the detection routine is not perfect. Sometimes the shot passes straight through them. This routine may have to be changed later to use XY position checking rather than colour checking, but this may slow things down a little bit, so for the moment it's been put on the back burner. Jason began experimenting with sound too, trying to make white noise effects. Not being fully happy with them, although they are in the game, they're not used, and again it's another thing that's placed on the to-do list. He also started looking at using the Karar speech unit for the voices, and although he got some speech working, there's a lot to do on the phonetics yet. So again, that's put on the back burner. Sinclair Basic can be fickle at times, and Jason got caught out with the following line. Expecting the loop to execute four times, he was surprised when it didn't. If the first number is one, a match, it continues to try and do the second check. But it can't, because A is already one, so the next F statement is never reached. This means he now has to break the code down into separate sections to get the results he wants. That meant he had to change all of the other instances throughout the game. After a bit more research, or as Jason calls it, playing the game, he picked up on the room move routine, where the screen scrolls off in the direction opposite to the player is moving, giving the impression of progressing through the maze. This can be accomplished in machine code later on, so yet another thing on the to-do list. Jason also noted the points when the berserkers change colour, and begin to shoot, hoping to mimic this in his game. It appears to be triggered by the number of screens the player has passed through, something easy to replicate. So this session, we've seen a lot of things added to the to-do list. Tune in next month, where he might actually put some of them in place. This month we're going to take a look at Graphic Adventure Creator, released by Incentive Software in 1986. The two main adventure creation programs were the Quill and the Graphic Adventure Creator. For me, initially, the draw of having graphics dictated which package I bought. I knew the Quill later added graphics, but my decision had been made. So starting the program puts us in a complex looking menu, with many options to baffle and confuse us. Luckily, there is a large manual that takes the user through every step needed to create a fully playable and standalone graphic adventure. Luckily, there's a base game and a few example games that you can load, many of which contain all the boring stuff to save you from setting it up yourself, like the direction commands and things like you can't do that messages. Loading the first one gives us a completely empty and yet prepared world in which to start building our game. Like so many other utilities, the menu is not strictly in the order that you would normally use them or work through a game, unless of course you had planned the game right down to the very last detail, including verbs, nouns, objects, messages and actions. For this utility though, this is the best way to go about things. Let's start with the locations. Pressing the R key will let you add descriptions room by room, and once complete, you are asked what the connections are, and here you can put in which command goes to which other room, so for example you can type north, taking you to room number 2. Once you have a few rooms done, you can actually test things, and this gives you a little bit of encouragement, because things seem to be moving along very quickly. But it all slows down as soon as you want to do anything other than that. So adding an object by pressing O will let you add the object text. It will ask you which room it will be found in, and this can be any of the locations or zero, which means it's not yet in the game. 
You can also define a weight so that the player can only carry so many items. So the next thing we want to do is pick the object up of course, but it's not as simple as that. The first thing you have to do is tell the program how to recognise it by adding a noun. Pressing N and adding a noun is quite simple, but you have to take note of the number. If we want to pick it up, we have to tell the adventure what to do. So we have to go into the low priority conditions. These are things that happen when the player has entered the room. We can use a line number, preferably one that isn't used, and enter our collection code. Yes, you have to write actual code into this thing. That makes it very powerful, but also a little daunting. So a piece of example code, if we want to pick up the axe, if verb 7, which is the verb get, and noun 1, which is axe, and here 1 means that the axe is in this room, then get 1, get the axe of course, OK, which will print the OK message, and end, finish. So you see how complex it is just to pick up an axe. And this has to be repeated for anything else you want to do with it, like throwing, dropping, giving, whatever. So what we have now then is a few basic locations and an axe we can pick up and drop. But that's it. There's no puzzles. If you want to add puzzles, it gets even more complex. If, for example, you have a door that you want to open with a key, the door has to be an object and you have to set a marker to say whether it's locked or unlocked. You also have to write code to check that marker when you're moving so that obviously you can't move in that direction if the door's locked. And yes, it gets very long and complex. The manual does cover a lot of the things, but this is where it really pays off to fully plan your game before even starting this program. Once you have all your locations, objects, markers, nouns and verbs sorted out, along with your puzzles, conditions and messages, you can, if you want, add graphics. Graphic Adventure Creator, as its name suggests, allows you to create graphics for all locations or just selected ones. Once in the editor, which takes up the top half of the screen, you can move the cursor around and draw lines, curves, circles and rectangles. You can change ink and paper colours and do solid or shaded fills. If you're artistic, unlike myself, you can produce some really nice looking images and you're only limited really by the amount of memory. Overall, this is a very comprehensive tool, but it will take a long time to master. It will though, when used properly, allow you to produce some great adventure games, and there are plenty of good examples of these to be found on World of Spectrum. So overall then, a fantastic program, if you are prepared to put the effort in. Well, that's the end of this episode. I hope you enjoyed it, and thanks for watching. You can get in touch by using the details on screen. See you soon.